the car's back, she's dead. She, she's cut all the hell. Two different men call police to report the same murder. And what makes you think that she has been killed? Look at her. You just have to look at her. Apparently, neither one knew that the other had called. The investigation uncovered even more unusual circumstances. But a few tiny seeds and a discarded candy wrapper were more than just insignificant clues. They told a story of revenge. Like many divorced people, Pamela Sweeney hoped she'd find someone to share her life with. Construction worker Larry Fleck was the man she set her sights on. We were planning on getting married. We were talking about probably moving out of Minneapolis at one time. I don't know, we were just, just having a good time, the two of us. She was a little kid full of life. And uh, uh, I don't know how, really how to explain it, she was just uh, made the house light up. Pamela worked as a secretary for a computer company outside Minneapolis. The most important thing in her life was her five-year-old son, Tony. On the Friday before Memorial Day in 1991, Pam told her parents she wasn't feeling well and asked if they could take care of her son overnight. She told them she was just going to take a bath and go to bed. But before she did, she spoke with her boyfriend. She says, what time are you getting off tonight? I said, well, I got to work pretty late. I said, it's going to be late. She says, well, I want you to come over. I said, it's going to be really late. She says, I want you to come over tonight. Fleck says he arrived at Pam's house around 3 o'clock in the morning. When he looked into Pam's bedroom, he knew something was terribly wrong. I seen the... Uh... Uh, spot of blood up on the headboard. Uh, oh my goodness! And in the bed, she was laying cross crossways, all wrapped up, rolled up in a blanket. I didn't want to do it, but I took the covers and I, I rolled them back, and there she was laying. Fleck ran to a neighbor's house to call police. Okay, did you see her? She's dead. She, she's cut all the hell. Less than two minutes later, as police were on their way, they got another telephone call. This one from one of Pam's co-workers, Patrick Walsh. Is that the Sweeney residence? Yeah. Okay, what's the problem there, sir? There's just somebody killed. Okay, who? Pam Sweeney. Pam Sweeney? Yeah. We had two males calling in, stating that a, a female they had known uh, something terrible had happened to her and they needed the police. When questioned, both men had unusual stories to tell. Larry Fleck said Pam invited him and that he ran from her house because he thought the killer was still inside. Patrick Walsh said he drove by Pam's house on his way home from a local bar. He said the lights were on and he wanted to check on her because she had been out sick that day at work. Police now had a dead woman and two men at the house at three o'clock in the morning. Investigators hoped forensic evidence would sort through what was to become a very complicated tale. When Pam Sweeney was found murdered in her own bed, police had to deal with a highly unusual situation. Two men were at the scene. They didn't know each other, but both knew the victim. Everybody's a suspect. And when they got out there, they had Patrick Walsh. He's a suspect. He's secured. He's handcuffed. They processed the scene. Larry Fleck was at the neighbor's house. Another officer went there to secure him. Pam Sweeney had been shot four times, stabbed four times, and her clothing had been partially removed. You go numb. You just. You're a thug, like you're 
your heart hits the bottom of your stomach and you don't know what's you, it's just like there's a humming going on in your head. You don't know what's going on around you. Pam's parents were asked who they thought might have killed their daughter, and they had a ready answer. You know, I thought her ex-husband was the one that done it. He had 30-something weapons in the house. He tried, to, he tried to be a big gun collector, and, and he had some big guns. So we, I, I, the first thing I thought was, well, since it's Pam, it's got to be Mike. At Pam's home, there were no signs of forced entry. And there was another clue that Pam knew her killer. We believe after he completed uh, the final blow and she was dead and he saw the dead body, he, in an act of contrition, covered the body completely. He was completely covered. We think he did that so as not to see what he did, to cover it up, out of sight, out of mind. The murder weapons could not be found in the house. But as the sun rose, Investigators saw a path in the dew that had settled on the lawn. It led to a wooded area behind the house. The officers got on their hands and knees and went through that backwoods inch by inch. Back there was found a knife, which had been stuck into the ground right to the handle, and a small revolver was found lodged under some loose boards that were laying behind the shed. The knife matched a set of kitchen knives inside the house. The pistol was the same caliber as the one used in the crime. Both had been wiped clean of blood and fingerprints. In front of Pam's home, investigators found a clue first thought to be insignificant. In Patrick Walsh's truck, police found a candy wrapper. The same candy was found in Pam Sweeney's kitchen. But this brand of candy had a lot number on the wrapper. When police compared the lot number on the candy in Pam's house with the wrapper in Walsh's truck, it was a match. So we drew an inference from that that this guy, while he was there, was calm enough actually to take one of those bags of candy out of the drawer and eat it. But this was inconsistent with Walsh's story. He said, after he found Pam's body, he called police, then ran outside to his car to try to get help. If this were true, would he have stopped on his way out of the house to grab a piece of candy? Perhaps the most bizarre incident in the case was that Walsh's car was stuck in a ditch next to Pam's driveway. Walsh said he accidentally drove into the ditch when going for help. Both Patrick Walsh and Pam's boyfriend, Fleck, had what appeared to be bloodstains on their trousers. And they both had plausible explanations. Both men said they were close to Pam's body when each discovered she was dead. But Walsh's clothing held a possible clue. During the time that Patrick Walsh was being processed at the jail, they, of course, removed all of his clothing and his shoes and socks. And we, uh, on the back of his shirt, located a leaf and in his shoes, we located a number of different types of vegetation. Investigators wondered whether this vegetation was enough to identify a killer. While investigating the murder of 35-year-old Pamela Sweeney, police had three suspects, Pam's ex-husband, her boyfriend, and her co-worker. Police learned that Pam's ex-husband was with friends on the night of the murder and was eliminated as a suspect. Pam's boyfriend also denied any involvement. They asked questions like how long I knew her, um, if I always come over there that time of night, you know, why so late in the evening I show up at this person's house, um, and basically asked me if I did, and I said, no, you know, I'm in love with this person. Why would anybody want to do something like that to someone? When Patrick Walsh's name came up as a suspect in Pam's murder, her family and friends said they weren't surprised. He did harass her on the job. He harassed her on the telephone for six months. Night or day, she did call the police, but there was nothing they could do. Her pastor, Thomas Braun, got a call from her a few months before the murder. There was great amount of fear in her voice. She was, she was beyond herself. She couldn't think straight um, emotionally, 
Physically, she was, she was a wreck. Walsh was married and worked as a supervisor in the same company as Pam. She told friends that Walsh asked her out on numerous occasions and wouldn't take no for an answer. He also stopped by her home unannounced and performed various household chores without being asked in an attempt to win her affections. He had been stalking her for months, obsessed with her physically in his, in his mind and his entire being. She's never talked to me about it. She's never said somebody was taunting her, following her, or things like that. She's never said a word to me. Pam did, however, go to the police. But they told her Walsh hadn't broken the law, and there was nothing they could do. In their search for evidence, investigators focused on the vegetation found on Walsh's clothes and shoes. Walsh said it probably got there when he walked across Pam's front lawn towards his car. This gave police an idea. We did something I had never done before. We contacted the University of Minnesota, and we asked for a uh, taxonomist, a forensic taxonomist. A taxonomist is an expert in living organisms. Dr. Anita Chalowa examined the various bits of leaves, grass, and other vegetation from Walsh's clothing. There was lawn grass, there was crab grass, and the oddball things, uh, there were some seeds of quack grass. Quack grass is a common weed, and it rarely produces seeds since people usually mow it before it gets to the flowering stage. This meant that the quack grass seeds on Walsh's clothing were rare and unusual. Dr. Chalowa also discovered another species on Walsh's clothes, seeds from an aspen tree, which are called bracts. Aspen is fairly common in Minnesota, but it's not the sort of thing that you'd see in someone's backyard. The combination of an aspen seed and quack grass told Dr. Chalowa that Patrick Walsh had been in a wooded area with high weeds. Dr. Chalawa didn't find any quack grass or aspen bracts around Walsh's home. Dr. Chalawa discovered an area behind Pamela's shed that was untended and overgrown. There was a lot of quack grass in there. A number of other things too, but um, the quack grass was, and it had clearly been flowering and fruiting in that woodlot. She also found numerous aspen bracts. The area Dr. Chalowa identified was the exact spot where investigators found the murder weapons. She was convinced the specimens on Walsh's clothing were relatively fresh. It wouldn't have attached itself to him for long periods of time, that it had to be something uh, real recent in order to still be attached to his pants and stuck in his shoes. But this was far from conclusive evidence. So police turned to a more traditional crime science. They analyzed the blood spatter at the crime scene. Walsh said he briefly shook Pam's body to see if she was alive before he ran from her room. But the blood on his clothing told a different story. The staining was consistent with him coming in contact with a large amount of her blood on his pants leg, and stains consistent with spatter being found on him, which would indicate that he had been in close proximity when she was being stabbed. And the size and shape of the spatter indicated the blood hit Walsh's pants from a blood-covered object that had been in motion. Investigators found similar blood spatter on the ceiling above the bed. These were perfectly circular, indicating the blood went straight up from the impact site. The blood spatters give us a fairly good idea of where she may have been, and also the nature of the attack, and how, how violent it was, how brutal it was, and how the knife was wielded. I could look at the bloodstain patterns on the walls and determine the site where this impact took place. And this was right on the bed where she was found and it indicated that that's exactly where she was attacked uh, on the bed. She was stabbed in the bedroom, but shot elsewhere. There was a blood trail leading to the bedroom from the foyer, 
and bullets were found in the floor. This was where Pam Sweeney was shot. We believe she was probably shot first in the lower levels of the house and dragged or carried upstairs and then stabbed in her bedroom and died most likely from, from the stab wounds, not, not the gunshot wounds. A blood stain on Walsh's pants was consistent with carrying a bleeding person. The forensic evidence also explained why Patrick Walsh called police to report the murder. Patrick Walsh, in a panic, attempting to leave the scene of this uh, killing, got in his pickup truck, miscalculated the driveway, and drove into the ditch. It's now 3 o'clock in the morning. He had just murdered a young woman, and his pickup truck is hopelessly stuck in a ditch. What do you do? A week before her death, Pam Sweeney told her family she couldn't find a set of house keys and was considering changing her locks. On the day of her murder, the keys resurfaced. In the front seat of Patrick Walsh's black pickup truck, lo and behold, was Pamela Sweeney's stolen keys. So there was a direct connection. He never really explained how it got there. Police believe Walsh stole the keys while he and Pam were at work. Proof, they said, that he planned the attack. About a week before the killing, he had called up an ex-girlfriend and wanted to get his 22 caliber handgun returned. He had loaned it to her earlier. He wanted it back. He claimed it was for an elk hunting trip he was going to make, but that was, we found out later, not planned for eight months down the road. So we believe he was actively engaged in planning this uh, well before uh, the day of the killing. Inside Walsh's home, police found a number of 22 caliber shells. Those were sent to the FBI laboratory for neutron activation analysis. They were able to identify that the lead compositions in the lead fragments that we found in Miss Sweeney's skull matched the lead compositions that were in the shells found in Mr. Walsh's apartment. A few years earlier, Walsh was allegedly involved in eight assault cases with other women and was a suspect in a previous murder. Prosecutors believe when Pam Sweeney rejected Walsh's advances, he sought revenge. Our belief was that that just infuriated him. I think he took the view in his sick, twisted, psychotic mind, how dare you reject me when I have been doing all of these overtly kind acts for you? How dare you? The evidence suggests Walsh entered Pam's home around 11 p.m. while Pam was asleep. But she must have heard someone inside and made her way to the hallway where she confronted Walsh. There was an argument. We keep rejecting. Walsh fired twice into the floor, possibly to scare her. The next four shots hit Pamela Sweeney. Walsh carried her to the bedroom, then stabbed her to death, causing the blood spatter on the ceiling and on his clothes, then covered the body, a telltale clue that the killer was someone Pam knew. The evidence suggests Walsh stayed long enough to have a can of soda and grab a piece of candy. And when he went to his car, he left the candy wrapper on the seat beside him. But he accidentally drove his car into a ravine on the side of the driveway and couldn't get it out. Walsh then went back inside the house in the basement to look for something to get his car free. Then, a surprise. Pam's boyfriend, Larry Fleck, arrived after work. When Fleck discovered the murder, he ran to a neighbor's home for help. Walsh had to act quickly. He tried again to move his car, but couldn't, so he had to remove the evidence. The botanical evidence on his pants proved Walsh ran into the high grass and woods behind Pam's home to dump the murder weapons. When he returned, and knowing police would find his car, 
Walsh had no choice but to call police himself to make it appear as if he, too, had driven by and found Pam dead. It was clear to me that the suspect had been in that woodlot. I don't see how he could have acquired that material any other way based on what the investigating officers knew of where he had been at the time of the crime and the previous 24 hours. I guess the irony of it is in going to that location and, and picking up those soil samples and the seeds from the local trees, he did put himself right at the very spot where he was trying to hide evidence that he didn't want to be connected to. So I think that's, that's fairly significant. Seven months after Pamela Sweeney's death, Patrick Walsh went to trial for first-degree murder. The sheer volume of forensic evidence against him was overwhelming. It's amazing when you're prosecuting a first-degree murder case and you have a thousand puzzles and you're convinced that you have the right person. It is amazing how those pieces of, of the puzzle start to fall together, fitting perfectly. Patrick Walsh was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. Patrick Walsh is a psychopath and perhaps the most dangerous man I have ever seen. I favored a death penalty, but then again, from what I hear, what's happening to him once in a while in prison, I think he's probably got a harder time right now being alive than being dead.